Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I sit down with Dr. Wes Gray, CEO of the quantitative investing firm Alpha Architect. We discuss the opportunity in value stocks today, why value investing works over time but what may cause not to work in the future, first principles in investing and the value multiple Wes holds above all others, and the importance of education and transparency in empowering investors to make the best long-term decisions. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the discussion. All right, Wes, uh, thanks for jumping on with us today. Wes, you are a author of multiple books. You're the CEO of Alpha Architect. You're a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. You're a captain. Um, You you were an assistant professor. You're a husband, a father of three. So the first question is, is there anything left in your life that you think you want to accomplish or what? Uh, yeah, I'd like to get the value premium to uh, go positive for one time in my life. Uh, <laughs> that, nice. That's about all I'm at this point. Um, I'm yeah, tired of being it. motivated. I, now, I'm new, now my dedication is to help other people be motivated. So if they need, if they need help building something or achieving something, sign me up on the crew. But I'm, uh, I'm kind of tapped out on uh, extreme motivation uh, for me personally. It's just, uh, you know, been there, done that. Uh, well, you, yeah, you certainly are a motivator for, for, for a lot of folks, um, you know, in the investing community and the things that you do outside of that with things like the March and stuff. So, um, so the first uh, question we wanted to sort of just talk to you about is, you know, obviously it's been a, a very tough struggle for value here. It's yeah. been almost probably a decade of value underperforming, particularly like large cap growth. Yeah. And so there's some people that, you know, might be starting to question whether value works anymore or whether there's something fundamentally broken with yeah. value investing. So, I mean, you obviously run a lot of quantitative strategies. Many of them are in this sort of value camp. Yeah. So, you know, we wanted just to ask you, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what are your feelings on sort of the performance, the underperformance of value and what those things are telling you today about the long-term future of traditional value investing as we know it? Sure. So, um, yeah, so, so a few things I would say is, is the one thing is when people say value has gotten destroyed, it's always a relative statement to, you know, expensive growthy type things. And that's definitely a factual statement. So on a relative basis, uh, especially U.S. value, you know, obviously U.S. growth has crushed it and U.S. value has relatively not crushed it. But when you kind of step away from that lens, like value as a long only strategy, it's still been making a lot of money. So it's just that the most expensive kind of tech laden securities like the quote unquote gross stocks have just whooped it on so hard. Right. So so it's not that like being a value investor has been a bad thing. Uh, at least in a U.S. based sense, you still made money. You know these firms have grown, etc. It's just that your return relative stunk. Um, and so, and and what, what's interesting about that is, is when you look at like an argument like what Asnes made recently, it tells you one story. He says, "Look at the long short spread is insane right now, and that's crazy. And if you believe in any form of mean reversion, you might want to bet on that." Uh, and I, by mean that, I mean long, short value, right? And that's a reasonable argument. But most people don't invest in long, short value. They invest in long, only value. Well, guess what? Long, only value ain't that cheap. Like, it's actually had PE inflation over the last 10 years, arguably, right? Because, because the overall stock market has gotten so expensive and drifted uh, you know, down in, in a, I always think in yields turn, I'll, I'll flip it to PE to make it less confusing, but it's drifted up in a valuation sense. So that doesn't, so all the, even the cheapest stocks have also drifted up. So even dirt ball value securities have, have enjoyed a valuation bump, right? And so if you look at on an absolute basis relative to time, 
value stocks are kind of like whatever, mid-range cheap, if you're a long-only value person. And so do I believe that they'll relatively outperform the rest of the market because the overall spread is, is rich? Sure. But that doesn't tell you anything about the absolute performance, right? It's just it, going forward because valuations are just overall so high, I, I would expect that value as a long only strategy, how most people implement it, will be relatively good, but overall shitty, right? And if you're happy with that, that's cool. Um, but it's probably just something to, to highlight because there's you know, been a lot of these crazy debates on what ASNA says versus what other people say. And, and as this obviously speaking to that very specific long short bet, um, and I would agree with them, that one's probably pretty compelling uh, on an app, like just overall, because because now there you don't have to worry about the beta component of it. So I want to ask you about on a relative basis, I want to ask you about these arguments that value is dead. You know, you, you've heard a lot of them and I, I tried to, I'm a big value guy like you are, but I tried to write an article a while back where I tried to make the case against value stocks. And I talked about, yeah. you know, technology has changed things or low interest rates yeah. have changed things. I tried to make all the arguments people have made, you know, yeah. and I wasn't able to convince myself, but I'm just yeah. wondering when you look at all that, do you see anything that's happened here that would lead you to question value? Or do you think this is all really just another long period of underperformance like many we've seen in the past? Um, yeah. So on anything like this, I always sit back and try to think like, well, why does anything earn money? Right. And so if you think about securities, um, you basically get paid one of three ways. You're going to have earnings growth. You're going to have a, a di current dividend yield you receive. And then you're going to have to sell this asset again, right? And there's, so there's going to be some sort of valuation component of your return. Um, and so if you look at like value, why the hell does value work? Well, so presumably value or the economy and all stocks are going to grow roughly their earnings growth rate with the overall economy, plus or minus, you know, something. And then you're going to have that dividend yield. Well, and then you're going to have this valuation change. So with value, you usually get the generic earnings growth, or maybe it's a little bit crappier in the short run and it kind of mean reverts back to normal. You, and so, so you kind of win, lose, it's, you know, you're hanging, hanging tough there. Um, on the dividend yield, you obviously generally get a higher carry with value because the dividend yields you're buying at are typically higher than like, you know, the alternatives. And then where you usually, you know, get the, the wins on value is that you buy something at a P of five and then in five years, or whatever you can turn around and sell for a P of 10, right? That value, that valuation uh, difference. And so when someone asks me, Hey, is value going to work in the future? I would just say the following. I was like, well, do you think that the firms will have some sort of earnings growth? You obviously need earnings growth to have an E which you would get paid a P for at some point. So, okay. If you think they're going to grow, with the general economy, good, or even lower in the economy, fine. Um, do they have, are you buying them at higher yields than overall market? That's a bird in the hand, right? If you're buying stocks that are paying 3% yield and the market is a whatever, one and a half percent yield, you're banking one and a half for sure. So if you get that, that's kind of like, that's great. And that could offset any sort of poor earnings growth you have. And then the final component is like the change in the valuation. So, so at the end, when you sell it, you buy the thing at five, uh, are you going to sell it at three times PE? Are you going to sell it at five? Or are you going to maybe get to sell it at 10? Um, so for value to work and presuming how it's worked in the past, generally when you buy dirt balls, you, you buy them at five, you on average get to sell them at a little bit higher. Uh, but let's just throw that away. Let's say that doesn't happen. You buy it at five PE, you got to buy it at five PE again. Great, that's a wash. Um, and that would suck for value premium, right? Then the other component is the carry. You're buying at a dividend yield of three, the market is one and a half, and let's assume payout ratios are the same, roughly. Well, you're always banking one and a half percent spread. So that, that's gonna contribute to your value premium. Um, but then let's look to the earnings growth component. If you believe that you know the overall growth of like this basket of value stocks is gonna be substantially different or long horizon than you know your the overall market you you could lose out there right so so the, it's just these three levers you can pull to make money on any sort of stock 
Um, and I don't see why there'd be any reason to believe that value stocks don't generally grow roughly with the economy on average over time. Uh, let's say they do a little bit less because they're not Google. But remember, Google's not the economy either. That's just one piece of it. Uh, the dividend yield, you get the bank for sure. And then mo I still believe that humans are crazy and they generally throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I believe personally that you'll always get on average this expectation revision component uh, over time as well as like an extra little kicker to the value premium. But who knows, maybe that doesn't happen. Uh, and that's why value wouldn't work. Shitty earnings growth, uh, dividend yield is so good, but it, the earnings growth kills it. And then instead of selling it at five PE, it, it ends up being even worse than anyone could ever think. And you sell it at three PE. That's how value underperforms basically. And I think OSAM had a paper on this as well. Isn't the majority of the value premium comes from this multiple expansion. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Changes in expectations, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The beauty contest you won, uh, the Keynes talks about. Yeah. So we have to believe that that behavioral component will still be there. People will keep mispricing these securities and we're going to get, you know, a better return because of it over time. You know, so if you still believe in that, then I would think that would be yeah. a pretty good case for value. Yeah, that, that would be one driver of your return. And then, but, then I, and, but then you still always have like your dividend carry um, and then you have to argue about on the earnings growth component. But yeah, definitely the mispricing kind of expectation revision element is a big part of the value premium, I would, I would say. I wanted to ask you about another thing people have talked about sort of as a breaking point for value. And that's this whole COVID-19 yeah. thing. And yeah. you know, all of us as value investors, we're using the price relative typically to some sort of past fundamental, you know, whether that be cash yeah. flows or earnings, or I know you like to use EBIT. Yeah. But some people have argued that, you know, when you get in a situation like this, you almost reach a breaking point where whatever yeah. those past earnings are, they don't really matter once you go past that line because companies are so affected by this. And so I'm yeah. wondering how you look at value investing in a world where we're maybe using this past data to predict the future, but we've had this breaking point that maybe makes it harder to do that. Uh, sure. So, so one, that's usually the argument all the time throughout history. Like, well, why'd you own all these energy stocks or why'd you own this or that? Like in any period, it's usually because something blows out in a sector and industry and like everything's totally horrific and like these businesses are all bust, blah, blah, blah. Um, but so I, I can only speak to what like our process is trying to achieve. Uh, and what we're trying to do is get the cheapest, highest quality value stocks at a given moment. And to the extent that you're a firm that loses your earnings power, which we measure through operating income, you know, through like legitimate things, cause like COVID, you know, screws you up or whatever. Well, when we're value investing, we want to get earnings power. If you lose your earnings power, you're not a value investment anymore. So that's check number one. And the value systems themselves will accommodate that. Like, we're because we're always looking at cross-sectional in a relative sense, right? So if I'm looking for the cheapest EBIT guys or girls or firms, <laughs> guys <laughs> broadly, um, you know, I'm going to look for earnings power. And if, if Southwest don't have it anymore, um, well, then we probably don't want to buy them. And then the other component is quality. Like we want to assess like, okay, you have earnings power, but when we assess like your operational momentum and different metrics that highlight that this is like, you know, a dumpster fire, uh, you know, in the waiting, well, we also don't want to own you. And that's fine. Like in this, this good example would be like energy, like energy, I think it was in what, 2015, mm -hmm. same thing. It like oil blew out, you know, got chopped in half. And, and yeah, value will own energy, but if you have a system that's dynamic to value quality, it's going to say, whoa, those are really cheap, but their quality is falling off a ledge, cycle out of those and go into something that's relatively, you know, same price, but has better kind of quality. And so I think the same thing will happen here. Like a good example might be like, like Southwest, right? So yeah, you're probably going to own it. It's cheap. It's got operating income. Yeah. There's a lot of bad expectations. But we will see in like the quality and other things if it's as bad as people thought. And, you know, and that's still a TBD. It certainly seems like it will be. But if, but if it turns out that, well, yeah, they got it. They took a hit. But when you look at the quality components, you know, yeah, it's hurting. But it's not terrible. And oh, by the way, way relative to the whole other universe of everyone else we're comparing to, they're actually doing pretty good. Well, I'd want to keep owning Southwest. Um, 
Whereas in contrast, just to give you the comparison, if, if all of a sudden there's other firms that have even better operating income to valuation and they have relatively better quality, well, I'm going to bomb Southwest and go buy that stock, right? That might be a Gilead or something like that, you know? Um, so it should be the case that your, your system of, of trying to identify, you know, the cheapest things you can find at the highest quality, it should be somewhat dynamic and, and built to withstand all these kind of scenarios. Because in theory, you would have thought about this in the historical sample where, you know, there's been World War II's. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Um, just shifting gears for a second, and maybe we'll sure. shake out some of that quality stuff um, in yeah. a minute. But I wanted to ask you just your thoughts in general on like factor timing. And yeah. if you just sort of where you stand on that, I mean, like with value being if, you know, the expectation is there's a potential for relative outperformance in value stocks, like how do you view you know, factor timing, uh, you know, should that be something, but just like, where do you guys stand on that? And how do you, and how do you, do you incorporate it all in your investment process or what's your general take? Um, so yeah, there's kind of two takes. So for my personal, like idiot investment process <laughs> in my, uh, investment account where I can just be an idiot and do whatever I want based on gut instinct. Um, you know, I, like Jack did the same thing, but you know, I was all, I went all in uh, from diversified right. global value momentum trend to like all in deep value, you know, at the depths of hell, you know, a couple months ago, um, obviously timing value. Um, but frankly, that was just cause it made me feel good. And, and it just, and I just couldn't handle it. But, but that there's a difference between doing things that feel good and intuitive and doing things that actually would make sense. So uh, what makes sense is from an empirical standpoint, first off, like factor timing, in my opinion, is damn near impossible. If you really sluice it up and look at all the, the wide, robust data samples, you know, all the things you can test on, it's noisy at best. Um, so first, there's not a lot of empirical support for it. But mm -hmm. then the other issue that I have with it, frankly, is that it, it's you're giving up a bird in the hand I'm talking specific to the, the context of like value and momentum when you're trying to time those things. Cause those are kind of the only two factors I really believe generate kind of like, they're like on the level of beta as far as usefulness. Um, you get a bird in the hand when you, when you compile value and momentum, because I think those things will structurally kind of act like yin and yang. And so, you know, you're getting diversification benefits there. And so when you take a factor timing bet, you're really trying to increase your expected returns, but you're giving up this insane diversification portfolio benefit. So the cost of being wrong is, I think it's probably nonlinear when you really think about it. Cause you have to be so right that that expected return benefit of timing from like momentum stuff to value stuff is so extreme that it overcomes this incredible portfolio diversification benefit. I, I don't think that that is plausible, which is when I do normal advice to other people and I'm not trading my IRA because I'm an idiot, you know, I always recommend global, uh, deep value, deep momentum, combo, strategic allocation, don't think about it type stuff. Because I think that actually makes more sense. And yeah, and to your point, I mean, you could have made a case before this whole COVID situation that, you know, you should be adding exposure to value. And obviously- yeah. That didn't go very well. Um, you know, yeah. the, the data, the spreads were wide coming into this thing. Yeah, um, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. They just go so, wider. And, and that's the problem. The timing of it is so hard. I know. And, and oh. it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that said, like, if you put a gun to my head, um, because I had to bet on like a silo, like one or the other, like I would bet on obviously the long short value spread over long short momentum right now. But, but that's not what I have to make a decision on. I'm building a portfolio. Well, I'm, I'd rather just keep them both strategically and, and not, you know, just own them in the, in the weights that I think makes sense, you know, as, as kind of a static kind of risk parity portfolio construct is what we do. Um, and just be done with it. Like li live with the, the reality that, you know, sometimes you can have an urge to try to time them. I want to shift gears for a second and ask you a little bit about the construction of an actual value strategy. So, you know, your, sure. your first step when you're building a value portfolio is how do you represent value? 
And there yeah. seems to be two camps on this. You know, one camp mm -hmm. is people who think they've found a metric that is better than the other metrics. And so they yeah. build their portfolio around that. And then sure. you've got another group who say, I can't really identify the best metrics. So I'm just going to yeah. use all of them. And, and yeah. I know you fall into the first camp um, with yeah. EBIT to EV, but I'm wondering sort of your thought process on that and, and how you come about selecting that as the metric. Yeah. So, so we don't fall into any camps. What we do is we want to understand what we own and why. Right. So, so sipping into any investment process, I want to make sure that I understand what the hell I'm trying to achieve in the first place and what are the financial economics that make that so. Right. So, and then we can go talk about back testing and all this stuff. Right. So, I, I'm all about first principles. Before we do any back testing, let's talk about what makes sense and why. Right. So, that, that's, that's what I am. I'm, I'm not a silo. I'm not a combo ensemble guy. I'm everything. I just want to do what makes sense and what helps me achieve uh, our goal uh, in the simplest way possible. Because the more leverage you get a pull, the more likely you're becoming overconfident and you know overthinking it and becoming too much of a quant. Um, so why or, or what, what is the main issue very specific to the value metric uh, horse race, which we wrote papers about, right? So I'm very familiar with obviously the horse race. You can run all the different horses of like cash flow to price, earnings to price, gross profits to price, whatever, book to price. And then, oh, if you combo them, you get this or that. Well, the issue is it's an apples to oranges competition when you do that. For, for example, a lot of people don't understand the, the embedded factor dynamics of value metrics. Book to market in particular is strongly negatively correlated with quality, right? Income statement metrics or cash flow metrics are actually strongly positively correlated with quality, right? So if I'm going to run a competition of book to market against book to market plus, frankly, anything that has to be correlated with quality, and we already know in sample that quality has a positive, positive expectation. Well, no shit, the combo is going to outperform the silo. But is it because it was a combo or was it because you were comparing a multi-factor process to a silo process? A more important test of marginal contribution would be let's compare book to market plus quality plus size plus negative screening plus whatever other multi-factor components that you're adding to this overall investment process and now let's compare that against that same overall arching process with the combination value metric and i have yet to see anyone show to me that once we control for the different factors that you were doing that combination metrics in the context of value specifically add enough marginal benefit to outweigh the questions of why the hell do you have book to market in your valuation process in the first place? Cause it makes no damn sense, which is the camp I'm in. Cause no amount, again, going back to first principles, um, no amount of Eugene Fama and back testing can convince me that book to market captures the earnings power of Google, right? And, and nowadays, everyone mentions this point because it's so obvious. Like you, when you're value investor, go back to like security analysis, the goal is how to identify the earnings power of this firm. Book to market does not measure anything related to the earnings power of a firm outside of insurance companies and financial firms, right? What measures the earnings power of a firm? How about operating income, revenues, Minus COGS, minus SG&A, right? Any idiot who's ever ran a business realizes, well, yeah, that's a pretty good indication of what this thing actually earns. Like Alpha Architect's a good example. We have zero book, right? We own like a few chairs in my garage, but we have EBIT. So why would I even, why would I include book in my value ensemble if it makes no damn sense from a financial economic standpoint? Um, and so, and, and of course, when you empirically view it correctly and you do apples to apples comparison of like combos, you know, given you're controlling for quality and negative screen, all these other things, you know, they don't add value. You're just adding noise or indirectly measuring something 
that you think is adding value, but it's not. And, and it's just, and what people get confused is if you just mathematically, if you combine two variables with high expected returns and non one correlation guarantee, and you know this because you know the in sample results, the sharp ratio will mechanically always improve, right? But just because you take two random things that have in sample high expectation mean with zero or non one correlation, that doesn't mean you should pull them all together just because it back tests better, right? And so we, when we wanna bake our cake or try to understand our investment process and what are we actually trying to do here, we probably wanna understand what's going into the cake as opposed to just saying, oh, that's a pretty cake, let's eat it. Because what if someone baked the turd in that thing, right? Like, it looks good, but does it taste right? No. Like, so we wanna focus on fundamentals and build systems that make sense from like a first principle standpoint. Um, so long-winded way of saying is I could go either way, but in this particular context, it makes no sense to me. Um, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you talked a little bit about the embedded quality in some of the value metrics, but you know, yeah. most value firms take it a little bit further than that sure. and use some other form of quality. And you, yeah. again, like I said before, you have kind of two different camps here. You have the camp, kind of the negative quality guys who are saying, yeah. I want to buy the cheapest stocks, but I just want to get the garbage out of there. Yeah. And then you have more of like the Buffett type guys that say, you know, I want to buy the really good high quality companies and I just want yeah. to buy them as cheap as I can. Sure. And I know you did, you dealt with this a little bit in quantitative value testing the yeah. two different approaches. I think you separated out Greenblatt's formula and looked at it yeah. that way. But yeah. can you talk a little bit about that and how, what you think maybe the yeah. better way to implement value is? Yeah. So I don't think there's any better ways in anything. There's just trade-offs and, and first principles. Right, so let, let's just put back testing aside. And, and I always ask people basic question. Okay, so why do you think anything works, right? It's usually because you're doing something that sucks, right, in the form of market risk or career risk or some sort of pain. If I go to you and I say, hey, you wanna buy this really high quality firm that makes a ton of money, has huge return on assets, return on capital, does that seem low risk to you? Most normal people, I know there's a whole literature PhD land that says that, it's, you know, in, indirectly, it's actually more risky, but whatever. Let's just do common sense. High quality is for most people, not high risk, right? It's also not high career risk. Anyone would love, well, before a month ago to buy Disney, right? Or Netflix, I guess now. So at the outset, quality to me whether it back tests well or not, out of sample as a standalone factor should earn lower expected returns because it has, in my mind, lower fundamental risk and lower career risk paying because everyone would love to own quality firms, right? Value, and so, so why does that all matter? Well, we use quality. And I just gave you an argument for why I think quality, regardless of the back test, will have a poor out of sample test. The reason I like in the context of value is value is once you've kind of identified the cheapest firms, which have good earnings power, but no one cares. These are obviously firms that are loaded with market risk and career risk and pain and anguish and hate and all this other stuff. But so within that context where I've already kind of siloed down to where expected returns presumably reside, I do think at the margin within that, I'd rather own the 10 PE stock that's like making money, buying back stock, paying down debt versus the PE 10 stock that is, you know, their asset turnover is deteriorating, like they're selling stock, they're issuing debt. In, in my mind, I think there is a mispricing there, frankly, where we're not all 10 PE stocks are equal. And, and this goes back to, you guys know, Piotrowski, uh, his old like F score thing and Piotrowski. So is a good paper that highlights this. So I'm admitting that, that I'm going to be cheap and I use quality to bless best sleuth out the mispricing. Um, but quality is like an overarching factor first, in my opinion is a priced thing because I don't see any pain in English in doing that. Um, just how, do, how does that, how do you, what, what specific metrics do you use to, uh, look at quality. What are you using? In uh, I mean, I think, I mean, we use, I mean, a lot of things that you would think. So like FS score, for example, but okay. it's basic things like 
you know, return on assets, gross profit type measures, um, and then basically net share issuance. Like that's more like a sentiment kind of signaling thing. Mm -hmm. And then we also look at like a handful of like, uh, like, uh, like operational momentum metrics. So it's, it's more just like getting an understand of kind of like, like quality is more like, how are you doing year over year? Because I don't want to be going into a train wreck. Um, and, and, and reality is, is that's kind of capturing price momentum. So, so if you just do like cheap stocks and then sort on momentum, or you do cheap stocks and you sort on like these kind of quality metrics I'm mentioning here, like operational momentum type things, you end up in the same place, um, like from a back test standpoint. But from an intuition standpoint, I want to own cheap stocks that everyone hates. And then I want to try to capture best that expectation revision potential that we talked about at the very beginning. And I think you do that by by finding those cheap stocks everyone hates but then find those that are pretty qual high quality because they're going to have the best chance of actually surviving mm -hmm. through whatever storm they're enduring that's why they're so cheap um and i think there is a mispricing there amongst the most hated and it can be proxied via uh quality metrics or you could use momentum too um but i think i think the quality component goes more direct to the mechanism which is why we like it uh, more of a first principles thing versus back testing. Um, Wes, in terms of assets for your firm, yeah. you actually forgot the rower and the squat rack in the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually That's more true. asset heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay, so our book to market, our book is like a thousand dollars. And I know we got my grizzly bear. He's probably worth three or four grand. So right okay, there, you our go. book is you know mm -hmm. five thousand bucks, but you know our EBIT's a lot more than that, so it's all good. Well, you know, and just in terms of wrapping it up and, and in terms of Alpha Architect and what you guys have built there, yeah. the story is a pretty, pretty amazing one. I mean, basically, you guys manage, you know, a significant amount of money um, yeah. at this point. You know, you've built a really good team there and you've done it all by running these focused, you know, factor based strategies. And when we interviewed Nate Geraci, um, yeah. who has that ETF um, sure. podcast, you know, yeah. Nate. Um, he, he said that, you know, a key part of Alpha Architect's success or the success of any e small ETF issuer yeah. is, you know, having, so, you know, a strong leader and a charismatic founder. And yeah. so, you know, we wanted to just get your view as to, you know, what you think has made Alpha Architect successful, you know, and what you think will continue to make it successful in the future. Yeah. So, I mean, well, first thing is obviously some damn good luck. Like, I don't know if you guys know our story, but like, you know, I got cold called by a billionaire back in the day. So, you know, it's always nice to have a little bit of luck. Um, but then, I mean, I think our main thing is, is we just have a clear defined why mission. Like we have an impact mission, empower investors for education. Um, and I just think that's something that a lot of people believe in and something that we're passionate about. And we're very authentic about like actually carrying out that mission and then you know and then we also have some set kind of core beliefs like we believe in transparency evidence-based systematic and win-win relationships and so we're just out there authentically saying here's our mission here's our beliefs you know if you have similar beliefs we like to do business with other people that believe in what we do and we're going to try to deliver you a product that is you know has a strong value proposition and we're going to get that thing as cheap as we possibly can uh, and deliver it to you. And is it for everyone? No, but we're going to do what we say and, and say what we do. Uh, and I mean, that's just, and then just grind hard every day. Like, I mean, I don't know what else there is to it. Like, you know, that, that's just kind of the formula. Yeah, no, that's a big part uh, of it. I mean, educating, yeah. getting the right people on the bus so that, you know, yeah. they can, they, you know, they can stay with you and for the long run. Um, yeah. 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 Just building, yeah. Having a great team and, but I, I, yeah, I think just having like having some luck, uh, like a core mission, and then just being authentic about, you know, trying to deliver some value for folks, and then just grinding hard for a long time, you, you usually the, the you, know, you kind of stumble into, you know, some success along the way. Um, one of the... Uh one of the things that's really impressed with me, with you guys, is you've been able to run these focused portfolios and you've been able to get people to stick with them. And, you know, that's one yeah. of the hardest thing is these focus factor portfolios can be really tough to oh, stay yeah. the course. I was wondering, yeah. do you have any, any like tricks or any, any things you've done here to attract um, the right investors who are willing to stick, stick through the tough times with these? 
Yeah, I, I mean, this is the this is the foundation core of our mission, right? Empower investor education, and in our core belief, one of them is transparency. Um, and, and so, for us, it's like, okay, we're going to tell you exactly what we're doing and why, and we're going to provide so much material from different angles to try to get you building up your spidey senses so you can make informed decisions. And our hope is despite all the hoopla and bullshit that goes on in the investment world that we kind of give you superpowers to like kind of be like a little PhD in a box. Right. And so when we produce something like crazy maniac, like outside the box, like focus factors, for example, um, which obviously have tons of issues in many respects. And, and there's a reason why the mainstream doesn't do them is because who wants to stick with these things that can bomb out, you know, for 10 years at a time, or whatever. Um, you got the education piece, right? And then the second component, I think is um, probably goes back to authenticity and just, you know, kind of Marine Corps truism about, uh, you know, officers eat last and lead by example. Like we build these things and we put our own money in this stuff. So like, you know, I can go to someone and say, hey man, like I know it sucks because I do this too, but here's why I do it. And to the extent you don't care what they say on CNBC every day, and you kind of understand the first principles of why this may work better than other formations, and you're willing to deal with this cost, then it could be a, a you know, unique thing for you. And, and so that's, it's always just been education, you know, eat our own cooking. Uh, and then probably also negative selling. Like, like we, you know, we don't tell people, like you can't, like our stuff can't be sold, it has to be bought, right? You can't jam a focus factor into a portfolio because if that person doesn't understand what they're doing, it's the worst, right? When it's whooping it on, they'll be like, you're a genius. When it's dying, they'll think you're an idiot and it, it's gonna be terrible outcome. So, so that's why it almost has to be bought, not sold. So, so we usually, you know, a lot of people obviously are interested. They're like, oh, you're so cool. You got a PhD. And then we'll say, listen, dude, you can't do this. This is batshit crazy. Like you, it's insane. You'll get fired. You need to size this at like 5% of your book, not a hundred. Like we anti sell. And, and, and so in the end, I think if people can get through, like they got educated, they're like, all right, well, this idiot's doing the same thing with his own money. So at least he's, you know, got incentive alignment. Uh, and he's like every single step, they're telling me why this is a bad idea. Okay. It's obviously been fully disclosed why I shouldn't do this. Um, if you're still there standing, you know, you've probably been well segmented to be successful, which is why like, like last month, for example, was literally our best fundraising month ever in value which is totally counterintuitive. Like, I mean, I'm not going to mention our value stuff, but it looks like an abortion, right? Like the returns are horrific relative to S and P as you guys know, anything Schmid value has just gotten destroyed. And yet everyone is like, Oh my God, we got it. Like is, which is counterintuitive. But I think if you train people to, you know, think long-term and process driven. It just over time, it seems to be working, but I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. We're also not a hundred billion dollar shop. Um, it's funny. The, uh, the first time I ever saw you was when you were on Bloomberg TV or something like that. And, and you were okay. on there basically just telling people all the horrible, awful things that would happen to them if they followed your portfolios. And I was like, I've never seen anybody on TV like talking like that before. And it was, it was really like refreshing to see you like telling people like the pain they're going to suffer if they try to, you know, follow these focus factor portfolios. Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's the only way to do it. And, and I, you know, the other thing to think about is like, you know, so the other, the opposite spectrum from like a business perspective is, you know, we could go on CNBC and talk about all our PhDs and how awesome we are um, and try to build a scale firm. But, but nowadays it's so competitive, you're competing against like Vanguard and I like, you're not going to be able to have a credible value proposition. So I think, I think we're all of us boutiques are kind of in the land of we're destined to be boutiques. And we got to be weird. We got to be different. We got to do something unique that Vanguard or iShares can't do, which means we're going to have like, you know, by design, we have to highly segment. Like, so we're, you know, we have to do that kind of stuff because we got to find the, you know, five buyers in the world 
where this actually is an appropriate investment. The other 95 million, billion, probably shouldn't touch these things. Or, or they should, but in a much more scoped down way, right? You're not going to, you know, buy like your stuff or our stuff in scale uh, unless you really know what you're getting into. Uh, right. You just use it as like kind of a peppering on a portfolio, I would say. Um, well, listen, Wes, this has been, I mean, you spent uh, certainly a a lot of time with us today and you've educated us and hopefully the people listening to this and watching this. So we want to thank you for, for uh, joining us. I see you got your, your March for the fallen shirt on. I'm hoping that it's still a go in September, although we'll, we'll kind of have to see, huh? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's going to be a go uh, regardless. We might just do it virtual. Okay. You know? So yeah. Um, virtual. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so we'll do a virtual thing. We'll try to rally some folks and, uh, so yeah, so no excuse to not be in shape, which I know for you is not going to be a problem. I'm in, man. I'm in. Yeah. I know something. you're in. You you <laughs> might you might actually PR. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll but yeah, see. so we're we're doing it for sure, just to represent and yeah. uh, you know make sure Gold Star families uh, know that we're thinking about them. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we may not do that in person. Uh, yeah. You know, we'll do it virtually, but that's all right. Eventually, this damn virus thing will you know pass through, and and we can. We could do it in person again. Yeah, uh, for sure. For sure. It might, it might be a few years. We'll, we'll um, have to see. Yeah. Well, thanks again for taking so much time with us. If people want to learn more about your investment strategies and get your insights on the market, where can they go to find out more about you? Uh, you know, just go to our website, alphaarchitect.com. Okay. That's the easiest one. Great. Yeah. Cool. All, All right. right. Thank Appreciate you. It, guys. Thanks, Wes. Yeah. You got it. Take her easy. Take care, man. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.